The Electoral Act Amendment Bill is one of the most polarizing pieces of legislation in the Ninth Assembly. Clause 52, which refers to electronic transmission of results, split lawmakers in the Senate sharply along party lines to the extent that a division was called on the vote for the first time in the Ninth Assembly. Say aye. aye. Those against say nay. The nays have you. After the public vote in Clause 52, the Senate approved that INEC may consider electronic transmission of results, provided the national coverage is adjudged to be adequate and secure by the National Communications Commission, NCC, and approved by the National Assembly. This amendment caused uncertainty in the public space as to the intention of Parliament in promoting credible elections and the fate of electronic transmission of results in future elections. Fast forward to Tuesday's plenary session. The Senate is reversing its decision and is giving the electoral umpire, INEC, the free reign to determine the procedure of transmission of results during elections. Voting at an election and transmission of results under this bill shall be in accordance with the procedure determined by the Commission. Those in favor of clause 52 as amended, say aye. aye. Those against say nay. The Senate also re-amended Clause 43, 63 and 87. Clause 87 refers to the procedure for party primaries, which the previous amendment prescribes direct and indirect primaries. The latest amendment is prescribing direct primaries for political parties. I hold the view, Mr. President, that it is cheap, much cheaper, less Kubasso, to have uh, indirect um, primary elections. If this our democracy will be strengthened, if this our democracy will grow, and if we are going to be able to take it to anything close to global best practice standards, it is time for us to adopt direct mode of primaries. Those in favor of the amendment to clause 87, four, say aye. Those against say nay. The nays have it. Briefing journalists after plenary, the Senate spokesperson throws more light on the re-amendment of the Electoral Act bill. This will allow INEC, when they have the necessary where we have and competence, they don't need to come back for us to uh, introduce electronic voting I mean, machine as part of the materials they will use for election. The Senate's latest amendment of Section 52 to empower INEC to determine the procedure of transmission of results during elections is sure to delight many Nigerians and those in the civic space who have been agitating for a reversal of the earlier decision. Linda Akibi, Channels Television News. Welcome back to Sunrise Daily. Yes, we're well, uh, continuing our conversation on that uh, subject matter. We've got Professor Atari Ujega joining us from Abuja. He's a former chairman of INEC. Good morning, Prof. Thank you for joining us on the program today. Uh, good morning, Chamberlain. Thank you for having me today. Well, you, you had spoken about how this was important for the country to take that next step, uh, uh, which perhaps some of these. But lately, you've also spoken about how this will, uh, at least to a large extent, address electoral fraud. That is why you were in Ghana not long ago. So could you tell us, speak further on that matter? Because the, even some ANIC officials did say, well, it's not yet to Uhuru. There's still some grounds to cover on this. But do you think this will address, to a large extent, electoral fraud? Tell us about it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chamberlain. Um, obviously, uh, as uh, is widely recognized, um, a good legal framework helps the Electoral Commission uh, to conduct elections uh, f freely and fairly and also with integrity. So I, I think uh, it is a commendable thing that the Senate uh, reversed its position 
uh, listening to demands or pressures or uh, 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 reasoning from the civil society uh, uh, organizations. I think this can only augur well for our democracy and uh, in particular for improving uh, the conduct of elections in our country. Um, obviously, using electronic transmission of results will eliminate what I consider to be the major uh, area uh, in which fraud is perpetrated uh, in the conduct of elections in Nigeria, which is through the manual transmission of results from polling units to uh, the ward level to the different layers of coalition up to the constituency level. Um, uh, there used to be uh, diversion with collusion of either security and INEC officials uh, to change results along the way. So electronic transmission of results has the potential of ensuring that uh, all these, uh, can we say, traditional fraudulent activities uh, in the Nigerian electoral process would be uh, checkmated. Um, so it's a very commendable thing. I think the next thing now is the, the INEC now has an opportunity uh, to deploy a very robust and uh, 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 cyber secure uh, electronic transmission of results uh, for this uh, objective uh, to be actualized. So frankly, uh, if the National Assembly can generally, and the Senate in particular, can continue to be receptive to genuine concerns of citizens uh, in the manner in which they do their legislation, this country will be the better for it. Okay, well, you know, Prof, we, we did speak with uh, uh, Fesus Okoye some time ago when this was done, and he had some concerns about some of the areas which he thinks would still be a challenge. So we'd like you to listen to it and get your response. I, I, I think it's quite progressive, but there are still gaps. There are still very serious and fundamental issues that the conference committee needs to take a second look at. One, our collation process is still very, very manual. And this collation process is adumbrated in Section 63 of the Electoral Act. It's still very, very manual. Now, if you look at the wordings of um, uh, Clause 52, uh, and uh, which talks about uh, electronic transmission of results, and then you look at the wordings of section of Clause um, 63, sub, uh, uh, sub 5, it talks about transfer of, of results. Now, we must find a nexus between the provisions uh, of uh, section 63 of the Electoral Act that makes the collation of results manual, that dom makes it do the dominant procedure for the collation of results, and then the trajectory between that and the electronic transmission of results. This is because at the end of the day, Section 63 still makes it uh, uh, mandatory for a presiding officer who, after sorting out the votes and counting the votes, trans to transfer those votes into a form prescribed by the Independent National Electoral Commission, and thereafter, the presiding officer signs the form and also stamps the form and also gets the party agents to also uh, countersign. And then he, he, uh, the presiding officer gives a copy uh, to the party agents and to the um, uh, security officials if they are there. And then these things are taken under security cover to the next level of collation, which is the registration area collation center, where the collation officer also does the same thing. And it is the results as collected, uh, the, 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 uh, the figures as collected that is transferred to the place where declarations are made and returns are, are, and results are declared. And these things are also manual. So we must find a nexus between the manually collated results and also the electronically uh, transmitted results. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, if a matter goes to court, the question that will be asked is, what, was, what are the provisions of the law in terms of collation? What do you think about that? No, um, I think uh, uh, it's a legitimate concern that has been expressed by uh, Mr. Festus Okoye 
Uh, he's a very good lawyer and uh, he's also a member of the uh, INEC uh, Commission. Um, I think basically what he's talking about is the need to harmonize provisions of the uh, Electoral Act so that one provision does not contradict another and so that at the end of it, uh, those uh, uh, who either want to cause mischief or who are aggrieved will not exploit the ambiguity of contradictory provisions in the law. So I think it's a very legitimate concern and uh, uh, I think it behoves on the uh, uh, two uh, committees of the how, uh, of House and Senate that are sitting to harmonize uh, the provisions of the bill to also give serious consideration to this suggestion that he has made. It is all value addition that can really uh, continue to improve the preparations and conduct of elections in our country. So does that in any way, but to the best of your understanding, Prof, negate the provision in um, Clause 63 about the counting of votes and forms, which prescribes that the presiding officer shall transfer the results, including total number of accredited voters and the results of the ballot in a manner as prescribed by the commission? Um, you see, obviously, at the polling unit and at the uh, uh, coalition centers, uh, as Festus Okoye rightly pointed out, the compilation of results is manual. Now, this provision uh, says that the new provision uh, about electronic transmission of results presupposes that as soon as election results are compiled at the, uh, 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 let's say, polling unit, uh, they will be electronically transmitted uh, to the different levels of coalition. But if you still have a provision uh, in the law that also uh, emphasizes uh, the technical uh, aspects of uh, manual transmission of results, then it's going to cause uh, serious ambiguity. Uh, not only ambiguity, may also even cause uh, uh, serious uh, legal challenges. Um, so I, I think the key issue is harmonization. Uh, to ensure a good law should not carry any provisions that contradict um, uh, uh, others. Uh, I mean, no, no, all provisions should be consistent and should be seamless uh, rather than contradictory. And, uh, and I think it's a very important uh, demand. Uh, there is no doubt that we have to go in the direction of electronic transmission of results. And where... Uh, there is any provision that uh, can uh, affect or negate or constrain that effort to uh, transmit results electronically, uh, those provisions need to be carefully uh, looked at and the necessary amendments also uh, 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 executed. So to, to what extent do you see this achieving the real, the ultimate intention of addressing electronic fraud if, I mean, voting fraud if uh, these provisions are not addressed as they have been pointed out? Um, I think uh, if I understand the position made uh, by, uh, by, by uh, I mean, the points made by um, uh, Festus Okoye, uh, there are going to be remarkable constraints, even legal challenges, uh, because of the ambiguity in this regard, you know. So, so uh, frankly, it's, as I have said earlier on, it's a legitimate concern. It needs to be addressed. And this can be addressed at the level of harmonization uh, by the uh, uh, committee that has been set up by the National Assembly to do so. Um, but uh, we, sh we should not encumber uh, electronic transmission of results uh, is the way to go. It will definitely improve, remarkably improve uh, the integrity of the conduct of elections. 
it will eliminate many of the traditional methods through which fraud is perpetrated and uh, the integrity of elections in Nigeria undermined. You know, so, so, so really the National Assembly need to pay attention uh, to this very, very important issue that has been raised. How hopeful are you, Prof, that the Harmonization Committee will produce, you know, the kind of a position that everyone is expecting? <laughs> well, uh, you see, I'm, I'm, um, I'm a remarkably optimistic person, and uh, we, we, we keep uh, hope alive. And uh, I believe that uh, the members of this committee are, are responsible senators, and uh, they are part and parcel of the decision of Senate to reverse its position with regards to electronic transmission of results and to uh, accept the need to uh, transmit our results uh, electronically. Um, so I, I think they know that they are now duty bound uh, to do whatever is necessary to ensure that another clause uh, in the laws does not undermine this very, very important uh, uh, provision uh, which the Senate uh, has now uh, agreed, which we can now say the National Assembly uh, uh, has actually uh, agreed to. So we have to keep hope alive. We have to keep urging uh, the members of the National Assembly in this harmonization committee to recognize uh, that they cannot allow any ambiguity in the legal provision or any contradictory provisions to undermine this very, very important uh, decision that has been taken. Hmm. Well, Prof, I know you also said that uh, since 2012, that INEC had been working on some of these provisions, I mean, robustly with software, trying to see that we improve. But there were some concerns that have been raised, and I think will always be raised, about possibility of hitches here and there. So if, at the end of the day, we achieve 60, 70 percent of this transmission, well, can, will that, or can it be ultimately be deemed to have been substantial compliance, or won't it raise a lot more concerns and opera about how those challenges have affected elections? Well, um, I, I have absolutely no doubt that uh, INEC has been uh, piloting electronic transmission of results with commendable results. And I think what this provision of the law will do uh, is to further ginger them up in terms of really now being more focused on uh, how to deploy a, a very effective uh, a technology uh, for uh, a, a, a sound uh, electronic transmission of results. Uh, I believe that between now and 2023, as they keep continue piloting uh, what they already have, uh, we would be able to have a very good, uh, robust uh, system uh, uh, to transmit results uh, competently and uh, commendably. Now, obviously, when you are dealing with technology, particularly in environments such as ours, which are technologically challenged, because we don't make the technology, we rely on others, we have to also uh, devote a lot of time and energy to trying to learn the know-how. So there are bound to be challenges. You know, but we should be, I keep arguing, we countries like ours need to be satisfied with what I call incremental positive changes. You know, if we can move from manual to electronic, uh, and uh, even if initially there are challenges, you know, we should be able to really uh, make substantive value additions which will add and improve the integrity of our electoral system. So I have argued before, and I, I will say it again, uh, there is no country that does a perfect electronic transmission of results, <clears throat> you know, either because of network uh, coverage or because of uh, cyber security issues and hacking uh, and so on and so forth, you know. But the important thing is that if you are committed to it and you diligently try to do it and you get a, a good cyber security and you train your people well and you have a robust technological uh, 
uh, uh, uh, software and hardware for it, then obviously you will make remarkable substantial gains out of it. So I keep saying, and I, I believe that it's possible in 2023 for INEC to be able to do what I can call uh, an A, uh, a grade in the electronic transmission of results. The objective should be to do it 100%. But if we can get 90 or even 80 or even 70, it's still an A. And we should be happy with that first time around. And we should keep on improving in that regard. But our fear of failure should not really prevent us from trying something new, something that clearly is the way to go, that uh, all over the world uh, is what is being done because of the recognition of how important it is to the conduct of free and fair elections and the elimination of uh, fraud uh, in the electoral process. So we've taken the decision now. I'm happy about the decision by uh, uh, the National Assembly. The Harmonization uh, Committee should now do the needful in terms of addressing some of these concerns that uh, are being raised by INEC. I, I must say that uh, um, in, in, reform, in creating a legal framework for the conduct of elections, it's very, very important that the National Assembly listens to the recommendations of INEC. And I must say that I have just seen a report recently uh, which has done an analysis of the recommendations submitted by INEC to the National Assembly and what, uh, and what uh, the National Assembly has now done in this bill. You know, many Nigerians do not know that out of about 37 specific recommendations made by INEC, the National Assembly now in this draft bill has accommodated about 25 and uh, fully accommodated, uh, accepted them, adopted them, and uh, about uh, six they, they modified, you know, and uh, it's only about six that they have actually rejected, which we hope perhaps in the next cycle of uh, uh, reforms uh, legal reforms, they will now accommodate them. They should listen to, the, to INEC, which is the implementing agency of the legal provision as well as the operations uh, of the conduct of elections, because whatever they say will be evidence-based and uh, with a view to improving the integrity of the process. So it's a commendable process as a whole. I think what almost undermined this very good uh, effort by the National Assembly was uh, what appeared as a self-serving uh, attempt uh, to jettison some of the very good recommendations by INEC, especially the electronic transmission of results. Now that they have accepted it, it's to carefully look at the other provisions that may constrain its implementation, okay, and then we are good to go. So let's keep hope alive, and let's hope that members of this harmonization committee will do the right thing uh, to satisfy the aspirations of Nigerians for free, fair, credible, and uh, elections with integrity. Mm. Perhaps all of that you know, inhibition initially was due to the information available at the time because part of the argument on the floor of the, uh, the House and the Senate was that reception at some of the interior localities were quite low. But hopefully that's been resolved now, especially with the other agency working with INEC that you mentioned, which in this case is NCC. But the one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, Prof, is uh, I'm just wondering I mean, how all those forms are now going to look electronically from EC8A and from all the various forms. Does that mean that all of them are now going to be in electronic form or exactly how would you expect that it will go? Um, you see, Fundamentally, all over the world, except where they use uh, electronic voting, all over the world, uh, unless they are using electronic voting, at the polling unit, the tabulation of results is manual. You know, but then as soon as the results are tabulated, they are certified by the returning officer and co-signed by the agents of the political parties that are there, then they are inputted, you know, either by a laptop or whatever electronic device is used, 
and then sent electronically to the next level uh, of, of coalition. You know, so, so as far as that is concerned, I really do not see what the problem is. You know, so yes, INEC may still have to look at some forms which it has to design, you know, and uh, many of these forms, uh, uh, it has to be recognized, will now have to be under the purview of the Electoral Commission in terms of the operations with guidelines as to how returning officers can use them. You know, but we should not really make a simple matter very difficult. It does not mean that once you say you are uh, 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 transmitting results electronically, then everything at the polling unit has to be done electronically. That, I don't think that is really uh, what electronic transmission of results entails. What it entails is to simplify the way in which the results from where voting takes place to where coalition of results takes place uh, is simplified and uh, you remove the human agency in terms of physically carrying that result from one place to another such that it can be altered, it can be changed and so on and so forth. You know, so if we want to do everything electronically, that's where electronic voting comes in. You know, because once you do electronic voting, you know, uh, 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 then obviously it means that uh, a voter touches a, a knot on an electronic device, you know, and then uh, maybe there may be a paper trail dropped in a box, you know, but as soon as he touches, his vote is automatically collated uh, 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 and then transferred to a coalition center, then that really becomes purely uh, a technology-based uh, uh, process, you know. But I think that we are, we, we, we are a bit uh, 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 not as prepared uh, with electronic uh, voting as we are with electronic transmission of results. We are good to go with electronic transmission of results, you know, but electronic voting uh, first of all, since the prohibition has just been lifted, it's now time for INEC to begin to look around for what, electro what voting, electronic voting uh, 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 technology is out there, which is adaptable to Nigeria, uh, then begin to source it, then begin to pilot it, you know, uh, 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 before then you can begin to think of how to start deploying. And even electronic uh, voting, it doesn't mean you have to start deploying it all over the country in all polling units at the same time. You can also, for example, uh, once we are ready to begin having found the technology, having trained the personnel, having acquired the equipment, we may do it in phases. You can start with large urban centers, uh, for example. You know, and if you can do electronic voting in the cities where there is higher literacy rate compared to the villages where, uh, you know, so all these are things that INEC will now sit and begin to review and to plan appropriately uh, now that the law says they can do electronic, uh, electronic voting. But electronic transmission, they have already been piloting it. They have already acquired competence you know, and it is easier to deploy than electronic voting. And I have no doubt that INEC is good to go now with electronic transmission of results. All right, Prof, we'll, we'll go to break and then we'll return and get your perspective on uh, maybe one or two other clauses. And then what is playing out in the political parties concerning internal democracy to join us again. Welcome back to Sunrise City. Well, uh, Professor Terry Jaga is still with us in our studios in Abuja. Well, Prof, when we did ask uh, political parties about uh, getting their, I mean, as a result of some of these amendments, particularly with direct voting, uh, direct primaries, I beg your pardon, uh, some of the parties thought, well, they would rather have INEC to come in and help them get their voter registers right because they don't think that within the political parties they can come to that uh, 
you know, amicable solution to that challenge. And, but ANEC themselves, I mean, Mr. Koye did say, well, ANEC, it's an internal matter for political parties. They don't see why they should come in in that regard. What do you think about some of these things? Should we let the political parties or make laws to ensure INEC come in or just make laws to allow the political parties comply with these laws for voter registration update first such that they can then properly practice the direct primaries within their parties? Well, um, um, uh, thank you, uh, Chamblin. Um, first of all, I agree with uh, Festus Okoye. Uh, I, I think that the organization of primaries and the conduct of primaries is purely a party affair. Uh, and uh, if uh, the law requires parties to do direct primaries, then it is the responsibility of the parties to prepare the list uh, of their registered members and uh, to also make it publicly available uh, and uh, for INEC to be able to uh, monitor the way they conduct uh, their uh, uh, primaries. The responsibility uh, of INEC, as provided in the legal provisions, uh, is to monitor. Uh, and, uh, and obviously, uh, they can do this, and they, they, they sh it, it will not be uh, uh, necessary. Uh, it is not even desirable to, to make INEC now be the one uh, to either conduct the primaries for them or to even compile their register uh, of voters. You see, the problem is that Nigerian political parties have not paid sufficient attention to their primary uh, objective uh, of uh, uh, mobilizing citizens on the basis of a clearly defined uh, party program or, or, or manifesto or, or with a clear ideology and getting people to register as members. So many, in fact, I recall that since around 2011, in INEC's engagement with political parties, uh, INEC had been advising political parties, you know, develop a register of your members and keep it. You know, but because our parties are dominated by the so-called godfathers and uh, money bags, uh, they are not interested in membership because they think that they can use money uh, uh, to uh, fill the candidates they want and to get the candidates they want elected one way or the other. So the issue of having members who are active members, registered members, was not their concern. So now, uh, if they are required to do direct primaries, you can't do direct primaries unless you have a register of voters within your party. You know, and only you as a party uh, should develop your own register, but it has to be a register transparently compiled uh, to enable uh, INEC, uh, when it comes to monitor, uh, to know who are people qualified to vote uh, in the direct primaries. I'm not addressing the issue of whether uh, the legal provision for direct primaries is good or bad, you know, because it's a matter of opinion. And uh, my own personal opinion, actually, is that perhaps it is not yet time uh, to require political parties uh, to do direct primaries. I think uh, there are certain things, because as, as we all say, these are internal affairs of parties. Uh, of course, we are all worried about the way indirect primaries are, consulted, are, are conducted in political parties. They are abused. Um, um, but the same manner in which they are abused uh, through indirect primaries, again, so long as political parties do not take their responsibilities serious, uh, they are also bound to truncate some of these uh, uh, requirements. Uh, I only hope that while uh, uh, there are serious sanctions for non-compliance, uh, if there are serious sanctions for non-compliance, then perhaps that can... Uh, uh, pressure political parties to now begin to do uh, uh, the right thing. So, so no, I, INEC should not be made 
to either conduct the primaries for political parties. He should only monitor, uh, keep records uh, uh, of, of what they observe. Uh, and uh, also uh, the parties themselves have to create their own registers because I don't see how you, any political party can do direct uh, party primaries without a properly compiled membership register. Well, Prof, um, <laughs> it's a little <laughs> befuddling, you know, when you know we hear that the political parties cannot conduct uh, peaceful or you know coherent political. Uh, direct primaries within cells because the question that rises up on my mind is 22 years after doesn't this in a way spell a level of political or democratic immaturity if the political parties cannot smoothly coordinate their activities beginning with how many are we in this family <laughs> I think I will, I will be a bit tough than you. I will say actually it's an indication of political rascality. It's not immaturity. You know, it's deliberate. You know, people have captured and controlled political parties for self-serving objectives. So no energy is devoted to organizing political parties appropriately as political parties should be organized. You know, so it used to be so-called money bags and, uh, and uh, godfathers. They are still there in many places, still very uh, influential and effective. Uh, and now it's even state governors who deploy state resources to control political parties in their states to decide which candidate uh, would be fielded and uh, do not pay attention to uh, the criteria, the appropriate criteria of selection of candidates and recruitment of people to be fielded for elections. It's all self-serving or driven by uh, self-serving objectives. So it's political rascality. 22 years trying to democratize, we still have not uh, freed ourselves from this overbearing control of people who just use uh, political parties as special purpose vehicles for winning elections by hook or by crook. You know, so we, have, we do have a long way to go, and that is why many of us are beginning to think that um, these so-called dominant parties are, 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 are really a, a, a huge, not only a huge disappointment, you know, but are a drag uh, on the democratization process uh, of our country. And that's why if we want to make substantive progress, they say leopards don't change their sports. Uh, waiting and hoping for change within these political parties, I regret to say, will be very, very, very long in coming. And that's why many of us are pushing on the need for a totally new purpose vehicle for democratic uh, uh, elections, for democratic uh, uh, party organization, and uh, for ensuring that uh, uh, we really uh, move in the right direction of both democratic development and uh, electoral integrity. So as things currently stand now, can this NPV upstage the PDP or APC as presently constituted? It's possible. It's going to be very hard work. It's going to be very difficult work, but it's not impossible uh, for this to happen. You know, so it's all... Uh, the attitude and the organization and the commitment that uh, and the selflessness that people bring uh, uh, to this you know so it's possible and uh, there are many uh, 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 nigerians who are committed to that because we can't keep on muddling through uh, our challenges we have to find ways to begin to address these challenges that are dragging us back that are constraining us from moving forward as a, a modern nation state, so-called giant of Africa, but clearly crippled and not making any substantive uh, uh, changes or impact. And largely because of uh, the poor quality of leadership that we have. You have people who really are not selfless, who are not visionary, who are not thinking about the future for our children and our grandchildren who are just thinking about here and now and what they can acquire by controlling state resources. So we really have to change that orientation 
And I, I don't see the scope of doing that within the existing so-called two dominant parties. Mm. I am not saying there are no good people in these parties, but I'm just saying that it's a very bad tendency that has dominated these parties, and the good ones who are in these parties have no scope to bring the kind of immediate change and relief that this country requires. So, in what form uh, should this new purpose vehicle take? Will it, should it adopt an already existing political party and then run with it? And should they be targeting 2023 or 27? Well, there are many ways to do this, but I don't think it's something that is, those who are really uh, concerned and who want to bring these uh, uh, positive changes need to get together uh, and, and discuss the possible ways and the ways, the pros and cons, and then move forward. You know, but, but I will not claim to, 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 to know uh, what the solution is. Uh, I may have ideas that I can contribute in a larger discussion uh, on these issues. You know, but clearly, uh, that has to be the objective uh, because it is one in a hundred chance, uh, for example, for PDP uh, uh, suddenly saying, okay, now we want to make amends, we, we want to turn around, you know, and uh, jettison all the things we've done in the last 21 or 22 years and uh, start to do something uh, new for Nigeria, for the people, you know, uh, detour for, for, for APC, I regret to say, and you can see the evidence in the so-called... Uh, a party primaries that they have conducted uh, recently, you know, is very fractious, is very uh, uh, disorganized. It's still, uh, it's either the governors trying to manipulate or other people uh, 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 who felt excluded trying to find voice, you know. So, so and, uh, and uh, who knows, many of these parties uh, may explode or implode. Uh, because of some of these crises associated with uh, uh, their primaries, you know. So we hope for the best. It's, we, we, I am sure that many patriotic, honest, decent Nigerians uh, are, are not happy to see these kinds of perpetual political crises and wranglings that take place in political parties and in the arena of governance, you know. So, so we hope for the best and we have to keep hope alive but apart from just hoping, uh, people can no longer sit and watch what is going on. People have to become more politically active and people have to become more engaged in finding lasting solutions to our political crisis. Mm, so do you think that it's going to be easy or difficult for maybe this, uh, uh, still on this same new purpose vehicle to address this question of national political party ideology, the national ethos, given the way uh, some of these politicians have taken advantage of our fault lines such that it, it runs deeper these days than perhaps a lot of people have already known. Yes, um, no doubt, uh, Chamberlain, the fault lines are there and they have been deliberately created, you know, but they are surmountable. Uh, I won't sit here and say it is easy you know, but uh, as I keep saying, it may be difficult, but it is not impossible. What you need is focus, commitment, passion, selflessness, you know, and a vision of what needs to be done. You know, and there are many Nigerians who really uh, are focused on that, and it is achievable, it's doable. You know, but uh, uh, as they say, Rome is not built in one day. What you need is positive changes. But a situation in which you take two steps forward and you make three steps backward, obviously it's like motion without movement. And that is a kind of situation, regrettably, that any serious analyst of uh, Nigerian politics and the trajectory that we've taken in the last 22 years would see. You know, and no nation progresses like that. You know, yes, people can make atonements, people can make, uh, 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 can change, you know, but as I have said, uh, leopards uh, hardly, uh, if ever, change their sports, you know, so you can't rely on, 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 on those 
uh, to bring uh, positive changes. Uh, uh, so, so you, and we have in a country of 200 plus million, you know, we have so many Nigerians who are out there who given the opportunity, young men, young women, you know, uh, can really help galvanize this kind of positive change that our country requires. You know, so, so we, we just have to keep hope alive, hmm. you know, and uh, keep emphasizing that it is possible, you know, it is not impossible, it may be difficult, but difficulties can be surmounted. If we fear difficulties, then we can't do anything, you know, hmm. and I think that's what should uh, really uh, uh, keep us going. But we cannot continue in the manner that we have been doing. Mm. Uh, in the last 22 years. It will take us nowhere. That is very, very clear. I, I'm, I'm actually amazed, Prof, when you say that uh, the, the fault lines were deliberately created because if those fault lines are there, I'm wondering what's the inroad for the young people, for the youths who are supposed to be, and they've been hearing it for donkey years, leaders of tomorrow. Many of them are raring to go. What then... It would seem like these fault lines are landmines for them if the young people get into politics without them being addressed. Yeah, you see, as I said, the fault lines are deliberately created through the mobilization of ethnic, religious, and communal identities rather than through forging a national identity and uh, ensuring that citizenship rights I primary for every citizen, regardless of where he or she lives in our country. You know, equality of opportunity is important. You know, justice and equity are important. And the rule of law, of course, is important. And unfortunately, in each of these indicators in the last 22 years, our country has performed awfully. And largely on account of the kind of leadership you know, that has not paid attention to protecting and defending citizenship rights, uh, uh, ensuring, guaranteeing equality of opportunity for all citizens wherever they live in this country, ensuring that the rule of law actually works, you know, nobody is above the law, you know, and, uh, uh, and also uh, utilizing the massive resources that this country uh, uh, has been opportune to have and addressing the fundamental needs and aspirations of our people. You know, rather, people in leadership positions uh, other themselves steal these resources or look the other way while others steal them or are incapable or incompetent to prevent uh, 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 people who are vandalizing our state resources. So the young men and women uh, obviously uh, uh, are either not supported to have the kind of education and the enlightenment that they require, or even those who have been able to get education have no job opportunities. You know, so uh, now with mobilization of re religion and the ethnicity and uh, the poverty that bedevils people, it's very easy to fall into the mobilization of, 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 of these fault lines. You know, so what is required really is to have people who will enlighten, who will educate, who will mobilize our citizens to begin to recognize that we have a country, we have citizenship rights, and a, a citizen is a citizen. All this talk about indigenous versus citizenship rights, you know, are, are, are really unimaginable in any serious society with a serious leadership that has a vision of building a strong country uh, 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 that can uh, compete effectively uh, globally. You know? so, so really the mindset, regrettably, the mindset of our politicians has been such that to win elections, you don't need credible elections. All you need is to mobilize people on religion or on ethnicity mm. uh, and then to deploy resources, money, mostly money that is stolen. For example, in this... Uh, Amendment bill. The National Assembly uh, is proposing that uh, somebody to be president can spend up to two billion naira. You know, a governor can spend uh, up to a billion. A senator can spend up to five hundred million. Where where are they getting these resources? Where will a candidate get these resources? 
you know. If not for Adangote and Otidola or um, such uh, rich people, you know, who can have that kind of money to contest for presidential election? So as I keep saying, they are turning democracy into plutocracy, government of the rich. You know, so, you, so, so there are many things that really are, uh, need to be addressed and only good visionary leadership that is selfless, that is passionate, that is patriotic, is committed to Nigeria as one country and can deploy national resources to actualize that, can move this country forward. And, and so, uh, really, it is a way to go, and it's possible to do it. It's not easy, thing, it's not a prof. walkover. It requires a lot of planning, a lot of struggle, a lot of mobilization and sensitization and getting uh, people yeah. to come so, on board. And it may also be long term. Okay. You know, because unfortunately, our politicians, our politicians are only thinking short term, you know, and that's really to move, to get out of this crisis that we are. Okay. You know, we Don't, have to develop uh, uh, short, long, uh, medium, uh, long term plans. All right. Let, let's wind down with this one, Prof. So will you be willing to, be, to throw your hat in the ring and be one of those leaders if the people ask you to? Well, um, uh, 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 Chamberlain, I, I, I have uh, for long now believed that we have made a mistake by thinking that we can stay on the sidelines and watch what is happening uh, to our country, the so-called Sidon look. I don't think anybody in Nigeria presently that has been educated by the resources of this country, that has held responsibilities uh, in this country, uh, has the luxury to sit and watch the way this country is being destroyed. You know, so we all have to, one way or the other, at different levels, join politics, you know, and contribute to bringing positive changes. I've taken that decision. I've already joined a political party. I'm a member of a political party, and I'm contributing my own bit in trying to make that political party uh, 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 organize properly and uh, mobilize people on the proper framework for engagement uh, in electoral politics. You know, so, so I, and I'm comfortable and satisfied with that. Anybody who can contribute in any way possible, you know, uh, really the more we have people contributing, then the better we have in terms of addressing these challenges that conf confront us or even bedevil uh, our country. So no more so don't look for anybody, frankly, if we want to get this country forward. We all have to be engaged at the levels that we are comfortable with. For now, I'm comfortable with being a member of a political party and contributing as best as I can to that political party. That does not mean that that political party would have to uh, act alone. It can act in partnership with other political parties in order for us to work together and pool resources and to be able to salvage this country. You know. All right, then, Professor Atari Uchega, thank you very much indeed for your perspectives this morning. Thank you so very much for this opportunity.